Today's okay. date is 13 May 2023. I am in Washington, D.C., and I've got the pleasure of speaking with Dorner Carmichael. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ma'am, for sitting down and, and sharing your story with us. Um, if you could just give us a little bit of background on, on who you are. Where did you grow up? Where were you born? Go to school? Okay, I'm from a small town, Jackson, Georgia. Okay. And I went to the University of Georgia uh, because to in this program you had to be a college graduate at least 21 years old, 21 years old. And uh, I was 21 when I went over. I had uh, graduated from college. I was looking around for a job and I looked and I wanted to tra I wanted travel and adventure. So I looked into the Peace Corps, which was two years, and the Red Cross, which was one. You could uh, volunteer with the Red Cross to go to Korea or Vietnam. And so I thought, well, I'm going to Vietnam. Uh, it was a one-year program, and I wasn't sure exactly what it was. It sounded a little odd. Uh, and so, and my parents, of course, were very upset. I, I told them I'd found a job with the Red Cross, and they said, oh, great. And my fa I was home, and my father said, well, we'll get an, put an air conditioner in your car and help you find an apartment in Atlanta. And I said, well, I'm not going to be working in Atlanta. And they said, well, where will you be working? I said, well, with the Red Cross, you can work anywhere. You can work right. in Atlanta and Washington and Germany and Vietnam and California. And he said, well, where are you working? I said, I'm going to Vietnam. <laughs> my, my mother burst into tears. Right. She was just upset. But uh, yeah. they saw me off. Right. What, now, what year was this that you went this to This was 71. 71. Okay. I, I had doubled up, and I graduated early in December of 70 uh, as a cost-saving uh, measure. Right. And so I, in February of 71, I went over. We had two weeks training in D.C. where uh, they gave us our little blue dresses and talked to us about military rank and s something about what we were going to be doing. Although it's still sort of nebulous okay. as, as to what exactly we did. And, and then they sent us to Saigon. I was in a class of about seven women. And uh, I got to, we all got to Saigon uh, they gave us a little more training and sent us out to our to our bases. I was my first base was Minwa Army, uh, east of Saigon, and we had a so what we did it was called the Supplemental Recreation Activities Overseas, and the nickname Donut Dolly came from World War II. In World War II, the Red Cross had a program. They set up clubs in uh, England, and they also had clubs in the South Pacific, but the England clubs, with the invasion of Dor Normandy, which was in June, in July they trained women. They had three women in these big trucks, and the trucks had a donut machine and a coffee machine and a phonograph. So they would drive their, um, they would drive the trucks to units that requested them, set up, serve coffee and donuts, and talk to the guys, play the music, and uh, just a touch of home. And so in Vietnam, of course, coffee, w that w simply wouldn't work. So what we did, we, there was, in the big areas, they had club mobiles. Guys could come in, play pool and cards and decompress. But the guys who were out on the fire support bases in the forward areas never got to the rear. <coughs> so, I w and I was always in the forward area. I w lived at a, Com we were stationed in combat bases, and we would fly out to the fire support bases, which usually had uh, mortars, artillery, uh, 105s, and uh, then the grunts, the infantry, would go out on patrol. One patrol would be out, and one or two would be in, and they'd rotate that way. So you could catch the guys when they were on, on the base, and that's mainly what we did. We would fly out in the morning with the morning supply choppers, usually the hot food, and uh, so we'd serve breakfast, get to know the guys, talk to them, and then we'd go around and do programming. So we had to make up programs uh, based on what the menu, which was football, baseball, and cars. And so we, it was like concentration. We'd divide into teams, usually north and south, uh, or sometimes uh, mortars versus artillery, and, and uh, they would roll dice or have to answer questions. Uh, 
like uh, Ralph Nader's Unsafe at Any Speed, what car was that? I think it was a Corvette. And things about baseball and football, which I've certainly forgotten. We had it written down. But, uh, and, and one thing, there, was, there were always guys who could not answer the questions. So I went to the motor pool and I got a carburetor. And so the game that I did, they would, they would uh, if, if they landed in the wrong spot, they would be, uh, they would have to stop until they answered a particular question. So I had the carburetor, I would dump it on the ground and say, well, you can't go anywhere until you put this carburetor together. And there was always one or two guys who, who could put a carburetor together but couldn't answer a question. And they'd go, oh, George, George. And so George would come forward, slap that carburetor together, and, you know, he was a hero. Right. And every time I was there, he'd go, remember me? I'm George. I put that carburetor together. Yes, George, I remember you. And we did things like that. Uh, we'd have paper airplane contests. You know, you make a paper airplane, give, give awards for which went the furthest or was the best, or just, and it sounds uh, silly, but it was uh, a diversion. And we would hand out, uh, from home, they'd send us things like yo-yos and new pack, pack of cards. In the monsoon season, the cards would, would uh, disintegrate pretty quickly. So we'd hand out new cards. Yo-yos were very popular. Anything that we could hand out in our bags, we would, you know, we'd hand out. Right. Did you did you know about this program when you decided to volunteer for the Red Cross? Was this something you that you knew you wanted to do, or even know anything about? I'd heard about it, okay. uh, and it was, and I heard about it. It sounded intriguing, okay. and so I thought, well, I'll I'll go try it. And as civilians, we could quit. So you could go home. Okay. And certainly if you broke any of the rules, you would go home. They had curfews and uh, you couldn't take illegal flights. We always had to fly in, in pairs. You always had to be on the manifest, any, especially in helicopters, because uh, if they crashed, they just exploded. So we always wore our dog tags and we were listed on the manifest whenever we flew. Yeah. How long were you there? A year. What, what, what moments stand out about your time there? Um, there, there were moments, uh, certainly when I was frightened, that something happened, and uh, and and then there were moments that um, that um, one, <laughs> excuse me, one thing. Men would come up to us to, I think, confess. They would show us their souvenirs, fingers or ears that they'd cut off from the enemy that they'd killed. And I think they were looking for a response. They'd done this and they wanted to see what a girl, a round eye, would think about that. And they'd go, look, and so there's a finger. And, and of course, no one told us this was going to happen. No one gave us words to say or, well, the best way to handle this is such and such. But you knew you couldn't recoil, you couldn't pretend that they were monsters for doing this. You just said, oh, okay, and moved on. And they would also come and confess things that they had done that they, uh, excuse me, they knew it wasn't them. And so you'd say that, you know, this is a war. This is not who you are. When you get back to the States, it'll be fine. And that was a role that we played that I, I certainly was totally unprepared for and just did the best I could. But I mean, you see a 17-year-old kid who, who had shocked himself by something he'd done and you had to um, make it better for him. She almost had to play a psychologist. Mm -hmm. And you had sometimes mommy, like, yeah, right. Even though you're not too much older than they are. I know, but more mommy, yeah. more, or an older sister, and right. and you were there. You had two minutes before someone else came up. Okay. So it was, and who knows? It was probably, I, I don't know. Was it inappropriate? Should I have said something else? I, I just did what I thought I could. Yeah. Well, well, I wonder why the Red Cross didn't didn't prepare for that because yeah. that had to have been something they knew was going on. Yeah. Well. We didn't talk about a lot of things that happened. Yeah. Even 
when something would happen if and you'd go back to the hooch and you had to put things behind you because the next day was coming so you couldn't dwell on what had happened that day I remember you just you the day would be over you know it would be over it was done whatever happened was over and the next day started you had to start fresh every day yeah every day and some days I mean the there were funny things. There was a, Fuloy was a helicopter maintenance base, and we always knew when we were going to Fuloy, nothing ever happens on a helicopter maintenance base. And they had an ice cream truck driven by a little Vietnamese man, and it went around and around the base, and it played jingle bells. <laughs> so when you had the Fuloy run, you knew it was an easy day, Fuloy. If that, I mean, in, at other time in country, it had been other bases, but when I was there, it was a helicopter maintenance. Um, were there any times where the bases that you were on was attacked or mortared or? Yeah, uh, and that was not supposed to happen. Right. So it was just, uh, it, it was a one-off. And we were to go to underground to the ta Tactical Operations Command. They had the deepest bunker. And our role was to get to the bunker. Okay. If you could, I'm not very good when I'm, sh you know, explosions. I, I'm not. It, I didn't move fast, and some uh, a friend of mine was. It happened to her, and one of the guys had to tackle her because she just froze. And so we tackled her and got her to the ground. But uh, at one time we almost got stuck uh, when I was up at Camp Eagle. It was in the mountains, uh, oh, 10 or 50 miles south of the DMC, and we went to uh, Rakasan, which was a fire base overlooking Quang Tree. And so it was up in the mountains, it was monsoon season, and uh, we were there, and they said, uh, oh, we're socked in, right. so you're going to have to spend the night here, because the helicopters can't come. And I'm going, no, <laughs> we, no, no, we don't spend the night on fire bases, although a friend of mine did, they had to, and that's one reason we were always went in pairs, they had to spend the night on a fire base, but I'm going. And so I th went to talk, and I asked to go up on the radio. There was a, a frequency that hit all the, you know. And so I said, well, put me on. And I said, there are two donut dollies at Rock Sun that need a ride. Can someone come and get you? And two, two choppers said, we'll come and get you. And they go, no, we'll get there first. So it was a race. And, some, and s they got us off. The helicopter pilots were always there. They, and, and everyone looked out for us. I mean, uh, they went out of their way to protect us. And there was no, like, we were, one time I was programming and one of the guys got really excited and he, you know, went, oh shit. A guy, two guys on either side of him picked him up and carried him off. There was no cursing, there was uh, nothing inappropriate. And it's hard for people to believe that because they see all these movies. And, but uh, it, we were treated very well. When you were moving around between the, the uh, different locations, it was always helicopter? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, occasionally, we'd go in a Jeep someplace, but that was so uncommon. In fact, uh, one of the most dangerous things that happened to me was in a Jeep. We were, the engineers were building a road, and so uh, this captain said, oh, well, it'd be nice to have a donut dolly come, and see the engineers that a general was inspecting them so and this was at Benoit and so we set out and we were riding along the road and uh, we ended up at a MACV headquarters they had little uh, places we stopped to get something to drink and the guys went where are you going from here and I go well we're going back to Benoit he goes kind of late the roads closed at five o'clock after five o'clock no one was to be on the road and um, so the captain went, oh, you're right. So we piled back in the Jeep, and we are heading down the road as fast as the Jeep could go. And I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what happened. I think he hit something in the road. And so the Jeep sailed off the road, and we ended in a chicken coop. You know, chickens right. everywhere. <laughs> so we crawl out of the Jeep, and uh, it something, the axle broke. I'm not quite sure, but clearly it was not going to go anywhere. So the captain, the driver, and I got stood by the road, and there was no one. I mean, we're going, and, and uh, what are we going, what are we going to do? Here we are. And 
we're standing there and standing there, nothing, no traffic. No, didn't see any Vietnamese. They, might, they were there, but not to be seen. So uh, here comes a deuce and a half. And we go, oh, good, deuce and a half. It was full of South Vietnamese soldiers, Arbans. And Arbans were not well paid. And a lot of them made, well, they would steal chickens and to eat. And so they were not, um, I don't know, I was a little uh, hesitant around Arbans. And so <laughs> the truck stopped and the driver was limping because he hurt himself in the wreck. And so they go around to the back and I'm following right behind They go, no, no, you're in the cab. <laughs> and I go, no, 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 I have to be back here. I, I have to, no. So I'm in the cab between two Arbans and me in the middle. And I, you're just going, what, what, where are we going? What are we doing? Right. Because all we could say was, you know, GI, GI. <laughs> because I don't speak Vietnamese, they didn't speak English, but they dropped us at Fuloi. And uh, so we're, we get to Fuloi, and the driver and the captain just disappear, and I'm there, and a bunch of helicopter guys are there, and they go, oh, well, you're going to have to spend the night because it's dark. And I just, it had been a long day. And I said, I, I can't spend the night here. I have to go to Benoit. And, I, and you know, there was no crying in Vietnam. And, but I, tears started coming down my cheeks, and I heard them go, she's crying. She's crying. And, and I was, you know, I'm trying not to, and I'm just going, I have to go to Benoit. I, I can't, they'll throw me out of country if I, I can't stay here. And so they got a helicopter, a loach, and gave me a ride back to Benoit. But that was the only time that uh, that happened. <laughs> but they didn't recover the Jeep. It had just been disassembled and uh, disappeared into Vietnam. Yeah. What, what were your living conditions like? At Benoit, we had a Quonset hut. And uh, it was, and it, you know, it was nice. We had cots and a Quonset hut, and there was a shower. They had hot and cold running water, kitchen. Yeah. Uh, we did not have air conditioning. We were required to send two girls to the commanding general's mess once a week. And they had put, they had dropped the ceiling in the Quonset hut, which made it cooler. And I was talking to, I was at the general's table, and I thanked the general for putting the heat block in because it made it much cooler. He goes, you girls don't have air conditioning? I said, well, no. <laughs> so that week we got air conditioning. It was very nice. And then at Camp Eagle, we were in trailers around a central uh, part with a with a uh, bunker in the middle. And that was very nice. At the end, uh, in December of 71, they closed Eagle. They turned it over to the Arvin Army. And so uh, they were reassigning the girls. I was uh, the program director. We had a field phone in the, in the uh, trailer. And the trick with the field phone, you know, you, uh, and, and you go, at uh, Camp Eagle, you get the operator. Camp Eagle, this is Kangaroo 66, give me Fubai. Fubai, give me Da Nang. Da Nang, give me Saigon. Saigon, give me MACD headquarters. MACD headquarters, give me Red Cross. And that's how you talk to the bosses, which w was very handy because when they said we're about to say something you didn't want to hear. You just cut off the conversation because you always lost the conversation. So that was what we did. And so they were sent. They were getting, uh, sending girls places. And uh, the two of us were leaving in February, February seventh. And this was, they, were, we were to be out of Eagle first of January. And so I'd still not heard. So finally they call me. And Michelle Morgansky, who was the other woman in my uh, class, who they weren't very fond of, she had been in the Peace Corps before she'd come to the Red Cross, and she was somewhat independent. And I developed some independence, so I was not, Saigon wasn't fond of me either. So fine, so they said, you will go to Fubai, which was oh, five or 10 miles east, and set up a new unit with two of you. There were no two girl units in country, and I said, "Really?" And so we we go to Fubai. I set up the unit. I set up the runs, and so I call Saigon. On we had a field phone, and I said, "Well, when are you coming up to inspect?" And they said, "Oh, civilians aren't allowed north of the High Van Pass anymore." And I was I was about to point out to them that I was a civilian too, 
and the conversation got dropped. So they knew that trick too. Yeah. And so, but I said, well, they're not coming up, fine. I, and uh, we were to stay until our DRO state, but a week before the DRO state, the command sent someone over and said we had to leave the next day, had to get out. And so I called Saigon and I said, we have to leave. And they said, oh, you're just trying to skate. You need to stay up there until your DRO state. And I said, well, you can call the command, but I'm supposed to, they told us to get out. And uh, so they, uh, we had to leave. So they sent us to, we went down to Saigon to get reassigned. And that, and I was sent to Phan Rang, which was an Air Force base, and it was really nice. They had trailers, they had a mama son, they had hot and cold running water, which we didn't have in Fubai. I mean, we had cold running water, but in Fubai, it was monsoon season, so it was cold. We had a hot plate, which is how we heated water for whatever baths we had, and for heat. We'd sit around it, Michelle and I, the two girls in the unit, would turn the hot plate on high and sit around it to warm up. Uh, but Van Rang had everything. They had, they had tennis courts, they had paved roads. It, it was really like stateside living. So it was nice to spend a week uh, in the stateside area before you actually went back. So you're, when you weren't, um, when you came back every night, mm -hmm. you were in a different spot or were you in the same spot for several months? And then same, yeah. Okay. Like and in Benoit, the yeah. It, so every night you would go back to your, your base camp. Right, okay. and the base camps changed uh, every, every so often. Yeah, three to six months they'd move you around. They didn't want you to stay in one place the whole year. And it depended on what they needed. Because units would open and close depending on the military. Okay. Uh, well, could you communicate with home? They had this radio telephone thing you could go to. Mars? Mars, yeah, they had Mars. I tried that once, but my mother could not understand. She had to say over. Yeah, they talk and say over. Oh. So she would say something and she would forget to say over. And I remember she was saying, Massey, Massey, she's been hurt. She can't, you know. And the radio operator said, no, ma'am, you have to say over. So I, I only called the one time. Yeah. It was uh, just too difficult. Right. You know if any of uh, the Donut Dollies were ever injured? Yes. Yeah, they were. Uh, but that's before I got there. Okay. When I was there on, uh, no, no one was hurt. They, four girls died there. Yeah, and uh, and that's one reason they were they really tried to be strict. We had there was a midnight curfew uh, in country, but every place that I was stationed there was a ten o'clock curfew. You had to be in at ten, right. and if you broke curfew, they would send you home. How, how um, so? Tell us about your homecoming. Um. Um. My parents picked me up at the airport, and I went back to Jackson, where nothing had changed. It's like I was, had been gone for the weekend, and it was all the same, which I found sort of horrifying, that there was this war going on, and no one seemed to know about it. Uh, and so, if you worked out of country 17 out of 18 months, you got your income tax back. So I stayed in the States about three weeks, and then I did the backpack around Europe thing. You know, it was it's what people did then. There was Europe on $5 a day, so I went to Europe and backpacked around. And, um, and then I went, uh, Europe, I, I don't know, I was restless. I was just kind of thrashing about. I went to North Africa where I caught hepatitis. There was a... Uh, uh, the the embassies had put out a warning that uh, infectious hepatitis was around and I caught it. So then I went back to Germany. I flew back to Germany because North Africa was not a place women really should be alone. What you did was you found Americans or Europeans who were traveling and you would attach yourself to those groups if there was a man in it because I, you really couldn't travel alone as a woman. And so, but I ended up back in a German hospital. And uh, they tended to keep you there. I mean, 
in America, they wouldn't have hospitalized me at all, but I was in a German hospital eating gruel and uh, just resting six weeks. My mother, <laughs> yes. So I was in the hospital every week I wrote a letter. Much better, be home next week. Getting, improving, be home next week. Every, every week I wrote a letter. And my mother had trouble dialing long distance. Those were the days when our telephone number was four numbers. And so usually someone had to help her make a long distance phone call. And, and so one day I was in my bed and the secretary from down, downstairs come, came up to my room and no one really spoke English there very well, but she drag, drug me out of bed and pushed me down the hall and go, America, America, and pointed to a phone in the hall. So I picked up and said, hello, who's my mother? <laughs> and uh, the first thing she asked me was, do you have a clean nightgown? <laughs> but the uh, Yugoslavia guest worker had been bringing me nightgowns to wear, so I always had a clean nightgown. Were you with the Red Cross when you were over? When you no. Back back and you were you were done. Yeah, I had uh, finished. Okay. Do you ever keep in touch with any of the other oh. ladies you serve with? Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, it. They're the only people you can really talk to. Right. And so yes, we're this group, American Red Cross Overseas Association, is a group of people who work for the Red Cross overseas. And the best thing about it, early on, there were the World War II women that we got our name from, Donut Dollies. And those women were uh, fantastic because when they went to war, we knew we had a year, but when they went to war, they went until the war was over. And there were the women who drove the, the trucks after Normandy. Uh, there were some who served in uh, the Philippines and uh, Burma. They knew the guys who flew the hump they were, and you know, it was even more unusual in those days for women just to do things like that. Yeah. And their stories were fabulous. There was one woman who, uh, she was in a truck, it was after MacArthur had landed on the Philippines, they were retaking it, but the truck she was on took a wrong turn and she was captured by the Japanese and spent uh, a month in an internment camp in Manila before they were liberated. So, they just had remarkable stories. How about any of the soldiers? Did you ever correspond with any of them afterwards? Or? Yes, yeah. just a couple. The thing about it, everybody had a nickname. Yeah. And also, you uh, didn't really want to know the names of the soldiers on the fire bases. If someone wasn't there one week, you never asked where they were, never. Uh, they could have been on leave, and then they would show up the next week. But if they just never showed up again, then you, you just you didn't want to know. Yeah. Looking back on your experience, how, how do you think that has uh, affected your life? Remarkably, I mean, I learned. I met women who my mother said the only proper occupation for a lady was an elementary school teacher. That was all you could do as a lady. And that was her goal for us. Uh, but I met women who just did what they wanted. If they had a passion about something, they followed it. And, uh, and so I'd always been interested in medicine, which my mother said was completely inappropriate. But uh, I w in talking to the medics, they talked about the new PA program, physician assistant. So I went back to school and did that. Uh, but I learned that uh, I could uh, yeah. have a life that I wanted, that I could pursue the things that I was passionate about. It, um, I think it made me fearless. Um, and like right now, I, I worked for 40 years as a PA and then I've retired. I sold my house and bought a camper. And now I volunteer at national parks around the country. But <laughs> I go back to my hometown, Jackson. And uh, my sister tells everybody what I do. And this woman said, well, so your husband likes to paint camp? I said, oh, I'm not married. And they said, well, well, you have a gun, don't you? I go, no, I don't have a gun. Well, you take a dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have a man or a gun or a dog. I just get in my truck and pull my camper. Wow. 
oh, and they said, well, aren't you afraid? I go, and what am I to be afraid of? She goes, those people out there. And I said, they're the same as the people in here. And, and that's what I found. They're the same as the people in here. And I have never, and I'm cautious. I, I don't remote camp by myself. But everywhere I go, and, and I learned that too, traveling on my own, everywhere I go, people have helped me. I, uh, and I, maybe I have good radar and I know when I need to be out of a situation, but I, I've, and traveling alone, you run into things. People inv invited me into their homes, uh, I've, and I've always looked younger than I am. And people are just kind and helpful. And, and so I've just been able to do that. Yeah. What, real quick, what is the organization that you're? American Red Cross Overseas Association. Okay. And, uh, and they're all women who've done this. And uh, so you can, uh, and so we have a reunion every year and we come to things like this and it, it's very helpful because uh, y you need people like yourself to talk to. People who can relate. Mm -hmm. Are there any of the World War II ladies that are still involved? All the, all the World War II ladies from Europe have died. Last year was the last one. She died at 104. Cute as a button. Had wonderful stories to tell. Yeah. And uh, there's still some that served in the South Pacific, but they don't, they're too, they can't get to yeah. these anymore. But I talked to one woman early on, and she had been, uh, when they retook the boot in Italy, she followed the troops. They gave her a jeep and a driver and somebody else to translate. And as they moved up the boot of Italy, she came behind them and uh, got civilian hospitals, took over a, a villa, found a doctor, got supplies, and did that behind them. And I said, how, how did you know to do that? And she said, oh, I'd been a social worker in Chicago. And uh, at that time, and I look, she looked maybe 60, ramrod straight, and, I, and she, I said, well, how old are you? She said, well, I'm 80 years old. And so it's been a great privilege to meet women like this. And, and what, at the early reunions when the World War II women were there, someone always played the piano. We'd stand around the piano and sing those World War II songs. Last question for you. What if somebody should see this interview in 50 mm. or 100 years when you and I are long gone, mm. what, what would you like them to know about your service and about the service of the Donut Dolly? Um, I'm sorry. We did what we could in a difficult situation, uh, and we tried to help. And we tried to help by you know, smiling and getting people to talk to us and listening to their stories uh, as best we could. Well, that's great. Well, I, uh, on the Americans, on the, uh, behalf of the Americans Wartime Experience, I want to thank you for taking some time out of your day and talk to us. It's okay. It's a great story that doesn't, uh, that isn't out there like it should be. Not, not a lot of people know, I don't think. Well, there were only a total of, oh, and I can't keep that number in my head, there weren't that many of us, right. and uh, and there have always been women in war, right. but it's just not ever talked about. Yeah. Because my mother in World War II wanted to be a wave or a whack, I'm not sure, but her brothers wouldn't let her because those, she, they didn't want her to become one of those women. So it's a little more difficult to women for women to become, you know, to well, do that. Thank you for sitting down and telling us your story and sharing okay. that, uh, getting, getting the word out about, about your mm -hmm. organization. Uh, but more importantly, thank you for your service. Because oh, well. um, it thank means you. just as much as, as, as anyone else's service. So thank you. No, thank you.